Now, I don't know about you, if you've ever had a dream in your life, not just a fantasy dream, but something that was real, it was a longing that just came over time, but seemingly became unfulfilled. And so this morning, I want to ask the question, how do you handle when you think God has forgotten you or has let you down? This morning, we're going to explore this theme through the lens of the biblical character of Moses. Now, if you've been in church, probably you've heard about Moses. You've probably heard a message or more than one message on Moses. And even for those of you who maybe have no church experience, perhaps you're still familiar with this character. Maybe it's through a movie. If you're of a certain generation, maybe you think of Charleston Heston. Or if you're a little younger, maybe you think of a movie like The Prince of Egypt. And you have a little bit of a reference. Even if church is not part of your practice, you've probably heard of him. How he stood up to Pharaoh and had the plagues of Egypt. Or how he led the Israelites out of Egypt and through the parting of the Red Sea. Pretty amazing, incredible things that Moses did in his life. Sometimes when you watch a movie, you see a big event at the start. You know those movies where there's just this huge catastrophic bang right off the, the beginning. For some of us, our only reference for Moses is that. We've got this huge explosion. But then through the movie, you begin to see the vast majority of it is spent giving the background of what led to that event. This morning, as we examine the life of Moses, I don't want to focus on his standing up to Pharaoh or the parting of the Red Sea, or how he led a nation. But I want to go back and see what all led to that. So if you have your Bibles this morning, please open them, whether that's on your phone, your tablet, or you've got your hard copy Bible, please open that now. I'm going to ask you to go to two sections. First, Exodus chapter 1. We're going to be referencing Exodus 1 to 3. And then once you've got that, so Genesis, Exodus, second book of the Bible, and get there. And then once you've got that in the latter half of the Bible, you can have another finger that's in the book of Acts. And we're going to be referencing Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 7 this morning. So you can find those. So just before we dive in here, let's just say a prayer, just readying our hearts to receive what God would want to say to us today. Lord Jesus, thank you for the privilege of being here. God, your word tells us that you don't just allow, but you invite us. Thank you for that invitation. And this morning, help us just to say yes to that. Lord, as I speak this morning, I pray that you would use my words and the things that aren't of you, that you would get rid of those. But God, your word that comes through me would sink in each of our hearts today, that your spirit would make it alive and real for us. That this morning, we can encounter you in your word, and speak to our hearts, to what our souls need to hear. Pray in Jesus' name, and if you agree, say amen. Amen. All right, so as we dive in, we're first going to just look at the origins of Moses' life. We're going to go through uh, the first 80 years of Moses' life. Exodus chapter 1, if you want to reference, as I'm talking through here, verse 29 to chapter 2, verse 10, I'm going to give you a little summarize of Moses' life. Moses was born at the time when Pharaoh, you are all familiar with Pharaohs of Egypt, Pharaoh, the most powerful man on earth. When Pharaoh had ordered the death of all Hebrew male infants. Now Moses' mom bravely gave birth to him. Imagine that, moms, knowing that that child that you are going to have grow inside of you in birth, you know that as soon as he is born, he is going to be killed. His mother bravely gives birth to him and hid him from Pharaoh and his guards for three months. Then she put him in a basket and hid him amongst the reeds of the Nile. Now, some of you moms with a three-month-old, you might be thinking, I can think of another reason why I'd want to throw my kid in a basket. This was not out of hatred or needing quiet time. But she had wisdom to want to see her son live, and she gave a last-ditch effort and put him in a basket upstream from where Pharaoh's daughter was bathing in the Nile River. 
Pharaoh's daughter took Moses in and took him as her own. Incredible. His life was spared. Not only that, but he was taken in by the most powerful home in the world. Not only that, but Moses' sister then asks Pharaoh's daughter if she would want a Hebrew woman to help nurse the child because she knew right away that he was a Hebrew child. And she does. So she pays Moses' mom to help raise him at the beginning of his life. This is the story of how Moses came into the world. And right from the get-go, we see a unique path presented to Moses as God brings him into a time of great mass destruction, but still provides safety and provision. As the scripture states in Acts chapter 2, verse 20, Moses was no ordinary child. He was uniquely, specially called. God began specially equipping Moses for the call on his life. For the big event that we know of that's at the start of the movie, God was preparing him for that. Now, while God would place Moses in the luxury and privilege of the palace, his early formative time was under his birth mother, and that equipped him with the teachings of the Hebrews. Think of the songs that she would have sung over him and the prayers prayed over him as she nursed him. Surely during these times, Moses' mother would speak about the promise of God to his people. It was here that his heart and mind were challenged and stirred with the passion of his people for God's promises. This is Moses' origin story. And it is in many ways a humble beginning with miraculous intervention. Moses is a Hebrew, born a slave, the very lowest class of people in the nation that he lives. Yet God elevates him to the palace of the most powerful nation on earth. So let's fast forward a little bit to the early years of Moses. And if you have your second finger in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7 and verse 20 reads this. At that time, Moses was born. Again, he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family when he was placed outside. And Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. That last verse again. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Now historians tell us that by the age of 30, Moses had led the Egyptian army to a huge victory over the Ethiopians. As these verses state, Moses was educated. As an adopted member of the royal family, he would have received the very best education Egypt had to offer. And Egypt had the best education to offer in the world. Living in the temple, he wasn't looked down upon like, or sorry, in the, in the, the palace, he wasn't looked down upon like his fellow Hebrews. He was esteemed and highly valued. He was also battle tested in combat. He was powerful in speech and action, which means he wasn't only smart, he had street smarts, and he had the charisma to be able to lead people. Moses could talk the talk and walk the walk. Now let's keep this in mind for later on as we see Moses' story. See, from the naked eye, Moses seemingly had all of the possible qualifications one could have. He had giftings. He had strategic position of power. He had Egyptian training, but also grasped the Hebrews' teaching, and had an apparent care and passion for the people of God. Since Joseph, no Hebrew had seemingly been more prepared to liberate his people. Yet there was still something in Moses' way. Something in Moses' way that kept him from what God was wanting to do. It was Moses himself. Reading on in Acts 7, picking up back to verse 23, the next verse, 
It says this, when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian today or yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. I want us just to spend a moment and look at this a little closer. Verse 23, when Moses was 40 years old, who decided? Those of you who have your Bibles open, when Moses was 40 years old, who decided? He decided. Not God told, not God decided. Moses decided to visit his own people. See, Moses had it all together. The seeds of those early years. He was called to lead his people. He knew that there was a special call on his life. From his very birth, he was no ordinary child. But the time and place for him to lead had not yet been received. And so he imposed his own will. Through those verses, he decided. So he went and defended and avenged. Because Moses thought that it was to be done. And he tried to reconcile. And then he fled. Some of us in our lives, we've received words from God before. You've received promises that God's spoken to you specifically, that you believed wholeheartedly, but have not had the patience to wait for him to bring about. Philippians 1.6 says, He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it in Christ Jesus. Moses at this time was 40 years old. By today's standards, not a young man. I'm sure he felt he was more than ready for his time. I'm 37 years old. I don't feel like a young man anymore. When I wake up in the morning, I make noises when I get out of bed. <laughs> I'm so excited. I, I can't wait. I'm sure he felt he was more than ready. And I'm sure there's many people around him who kept telling him how he was. But God didn't say he was. Have you ever in your life gone into something too soon? I know I probably wouldn't, to look at me you wouldn't think this, but I, I played basketball when I was growing up. All five foot ten of me, which is really five foot nine, but you round up if it's more than exactly five foot nine. But I, I remember the very first year I played school basketball, it was, I was a, the youngest kid on the team. There was only two of us. But for some reason, I had never played before, but I just decided I was going to play. So I tried out for the team, and somehow I made it. And I sucked. I played, <laughs> thank you. I don't know how to take that. But I played the entire year. I scored two baskets the entire season and playoffs. And I'm going to be honest with you, both of them, complete flukes. Like, I was not trying to do that shot. Completely fluke. I was horrible because I was not actually ready to play it. I never tried. By the next year, when I actually had a year of playing with my friends of trying... I was the second best player on the team. I scored the second most points because I actually knew I was more prepared and I was ready. We probably all, whether in our own lives or in the lives of those close to us, have seen the effects of people who get thrust into things too soon. We all know the tragic stories of child celebrities who suddenly get fame, fortune at young ages, and by the time they even hit adulthood, their lives are destroyed. Moses wasn't ready yet. He was sure that he was. 
He was 40 years old. He wasn't a child anymore. But Moses wasn't ready. You see, Moses was committed to the task God had for him. He was committed to leading the Israelites to freedom from the Egyptians, but he was not at this time committed to God's call. Moses felt a burden for his people. He clearly knew from a young age he was a Hebrew. He knew the plight of his people and probably had inklings of God's call on him to help free his people, yet the specifics of God's call. The waiting on his voice for specific instruction was not part of Moses' life at this point. See, he had a glimpse of purpose, but he had no personal connection to the voice of instruction. And to this point in his story, we see no personal encounter with God. Moses was lured by the temptation of purpose. Many of us struggle with that. We are lured by the temptation of purpose, a lust for accomplishment. And this can lead us to try to do things by our own hands. Yet as Moses reaches out to make things happen, it backfires on him. And a man dies at his hands. Then Moses tries to cover it up. Which is funny, that just seems to be the nature that we have. Is when things don't work out and mess up, we either run or we try to hide it. In Exodus 2.12, we see that Moses tried to hide the body of an Egyptian he killed. And then later saw a couple of the Hebrews fighting and again chose to step in. The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must have become known. And when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian where he sat down by a well. Here's what I want you and I to pull from this part of Moses' story this morning. It is one thing to pursue what you think God wants. It's another thing to pursue God. I'm going to say that again. It's one thing to pursue what you think God wants. And it's another thing to pursue God. To do it his way and in his time by the leading of his spirit. Think of Moses. The frustration and confusion. Why isn't this working? I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I was told. I'm the one who is going to liberate my people. I was specially gifted. I was uniquely positioned. Have you ever experienced this in your life? where God's given you a glimpse of something, but you get frustrated as you attempt to walk towards it, and it elusively seems to be constantly outside of your reach. The more you try, the more it seems like it was never meant to be. For a follower of Jesus, goals and ambitions not humbly bathed and waited on end up becoming a consuming idol that produced nothing but emptiness and destruction. You see, there is no shortcut. The big things that God has put on your heart, the things that you feel passion for, that you feel like God has uniquely called you to, can really only be done through him. If we want to, as the scriptures say, live in the spirit, we need to daily walk in the spirit. So this brings us to the next section of Moses' life. We simply call the wilderness. Moses' secret is found out. And fear and shame take over. And Moses flees Egypt for the desert. And he comes to the land of the Midianites. Now the Midianites were relatives of the Jews. And here he meets his wife and begins to work for his father-in-law. What man doesn't dream of that? Go from the palace to living at my father-in-law's place and working for him. It's a goal of every man. Moses had a great resume, but he was missing the most important piece, an obedient spirit. See, he had giftings, qualifications, and mastery. And these work in the corporate world, but these are actually not God's qualifiers. See, God looks upon character, reliance, and obedience. And these qualities are not taught in a seminar or grasped through practice sessions. Moses was never going to learn these things through another master teacher in Egypt. 
As many of you can attest from your own life, the true depth of character and spiritual growth in our lives is most often produced by the most difficult challenges. It is in our weakness and failures that we learn most what it is to follow Jesus. Experiencing failure can help till the callous of pride in our lives and provide the fertile soil of a teachable spirit. As the Psalms say, a broken spirit and a contrite heart, you will not deny, O God. A teachable spirit is the key to who God appoints to great responsibility in his kingdom. This teachability does not happen in palaces or on platforms with the lights shining bright. But rather, these teachings come in silent hills when no one is watching. Character that God desires is not produced in seconds or minutes. It takes years of constant life pressure and faithfulness. You see, Moses was still gifted, and he was still special and called. But God called him at the age of 40 to begin his training for the special call of God on his life. Forty years. Again, not a young man. But at this point, Moses is called to train in the obscurity amongst sheep for another 40 years. Moses had lived his culture not too uncommon like our own, one of privilege and power. It was about one-upping, showing your worth. For him, this must have been part of what made him special. His natural charisma, his natural giftings, the position he had in the palace. Imagine this. The only one from his entire people group who would be able to speak on their behalf The only one who would have that insight, who would have that power, and he was esteemed amongst the Egyptians. He got all the privileges of the palace. I'm sure at this point, he began to question it all. See, God needed to take him out and begin to strip away Moses so that he could finally be used. So I have a question that's a difficult question that I want to ask this morning. It's one that I have a hard time actually being honest with myself. Are you willing to be obscure? Are you willing to be obscure? See, God will use failure in your life and mine to help wean us off the addiction of approval. The lust for me to be seen as great, competent, or worthy. Failure will be the training ground to recognize and embrace the truth that we fought and ran from. That on my own, I am not good enough. I'm not capable. That I am nothing. God brings us to desert places so that the hidden depths of our hearts can be truly tested and transformed. As Jesus taught, the greatest opposition to your soul is not what's outside your body, but what is within. That's what defiles us. And like Moses, many of us are unaware of the abundance of things within us that still need to die. The selfishness, the pride that only the wilderness can touch. Out of his love and ultimate good purpose for us, God will prune and remove all the things that used to mean so much to you and I so that can be reduced to simply a love of him. Not a love of prestige, notoriety, perks, or reputation. Just him. I remember watching a movie a couple years ago about a a plane that crashes, and it was a movie about the Coast Guard and them saving people, and there was this scene where it was in the middle of the ocean, the plane had crashed, and people had been stranded for, I can't remember how many hours, and it's night, and you can't see, and the Coast Guard's going down, trying to save these few people that have survived. It's a great movie to watch while you're flying over the ocean at night, by the way. <laughs> and I remember the scene as the, the Coast Guard, it was, it was, uh, they, 
They had a lot of people who worked in the Coast Guard who they used in the movie to try and make it as realistic as possible. And one of the issues that they have oftentimes is when people have been trying to survive, they so want to get out, they're trying to keep themselves alive in their own strength that when someone comes to save them, they're so panicked and all over the place that they can actually drown the person who's trying to save them. It's not uncommon. They don't realize what they're doing and in trying to save themselves, they actually hurt and push away the very thing that can save them. In our impatience, we often tie ourselves in knots and drown others, make it impossible to be saved ourselves. God has to save us from ourselves. So God has Moses spend 40 more years in the desert so that he is now 80 years old. Have you ever had a dream, a promise you've held on to that long unfulfilled? Begin to no longer believe it. I don't know about you, but I begin to question God and if it was ever true at all. If God is true at all, One of the amazing things about our God is that he doesn't produce and prepare all of us the same way. You and I are uniquely handcrafted and prepared, and God takes his time because he does it right. Theologian Warren Wearsby says this, Moses' 40 years of waiting and working prepared him for a lifetime of faithful ministry. God doesn't lay his hands suddenly on his servants, but takes time to equip them for their work. God's delays aren't evidence of unconcern, for he hears our groans, sees our plights, feels our sorrows, and remembers his covenant. Churches and you to you, covenant is agreement. The Old Testament, when they do a covenant, what they would do is this. They would take an animal, and they would literally take it and split it in half into two sections. And then the two people would hold hands and they'd walk in between the two halves of the animal. Essentially saying, if you or I do not keep up our end of the agreement we make, may this, what happened to this animal happen to me. God's covenant, his promise with his people. What he has promised, he will perform. For he never breaks his covenant with his people. When the right time comes, God immediately goes to work. For some of you today, Are you in the desert right now? Are you at a point of waiting on God to fulfill a promise? Maybe even a promise he spoke on your heart years ago. Has God been molding and teaching you in the lab of obscurity? A natural part of created order is that often for new life to be birthed, death must be experienced. For our farmers this morning... When you plant a seed, the seed must first die before it can give life to a new plant. It's part of nature. And in order for some of the new life that God has for you to be birthed, something in you also needs to die. What is it in you that needs to die to give birth to the new God has for you? Finally, this morning, I want to quickly get back to our original scene and the fulfillment of the promise of God in Moses' life. After an additional 40 years of living among sheep in obscurity, you can imagine how Moses has changed. His life and his values are no longer in Egypt. He is married. He's had children. Newsflash, if you don't know, that changes your life a little bit. He's worked a new career and developed a new, different set of skills. At 80 years old, he no longer lusts to compete for the power and prestige of Egypt. 40 years of learning not how to be the big dog with the, with the best resume, the one who can achieve by his own charisma and special ability. He works a blue-collar job, is unknown and unheralded. Heralded. And here, here, at this point... What some may see as the lowest point is the key when God finally says he's ready. At this point, we see him encounter God, I am. In your Bibles, Exodus chapter 3. 
Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Holy, meaning set apart. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. It's here that for the first time we see Moses encounter not the teaching of God, the teaching of God's people, but the very voice and presence of God. And let me tell you, if you don't know yet, there's a big difference between the two. The first time you hear the voice of God speak to you, the first time God speaks directly, whether that's he speaks through an audible voice, he thinks, speaks through a, a still small voice within the depths of your spirit, or he speaks through his word, suddenly not just words on a page, but something that comes to life within you. When God speaks to you, Something changes. And here we see the response of Moses. No longer brash and arrogant. The desert has changed this man. And we see there at this, Moses hid his face. He hid his face. Exodus 3 and verse 10 so now, go, God says to Moses, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? What a stark change in attitude from Moses. Who am I? Who am I? I am the one who's received the best teachings from the best universities in Egypt. The one who is mighty in word and deed. Revered, respected, powerful, uniquely gifted and positioned. No. See, the years of obscurity have humbled Moses. We go on in verse 13. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Then they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. This mighty man, mighty in word and deed, a man of natural great charisma, not even sure what to speak or what to say. In fact, in Exodus 4.1, Moses goes on in this conversation with God to show his own lack of confidence in himself by asking God, what if they don't believe or they don't listen to me? Verse 10 of that same chapter, Moses says, pardon your servant, Lord, I have never been eloquent this man who is mighty in word and deed. I have never been eloquent. Neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. This man had lost all confidence in his own ability. The desert had done its work. Moses was stripped and humbled to the point that he was no longer believing in or leaning on his own capability. And finally, in verse 13 of chapter 4, he argues with God one more time. Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Please send someone else. You've got the wrong guy. I'm not capable. Don't you know what happened the last time I tried to do something? Forty years ago, I tried to do something. I ended up killing a guy, and all those people you said I was going to leave, they turned on me. You've got the wrong guy. I just screw it up. Theologian A.W. Tozer says this, A true safe leader is likely one who has no desire to lead, but is forced into a position of leadership by the inward pressure of the Holy Spirit and by the press of the external situation. Humility. 
The result of 40 years of training was a stripping away of any self-reliance, putting Moses exactly where God wanted him, where he could use him most. And from here we see Moses ready to step into the yes he wanted to back in his early days in Egypt, but now actually ready to do so. The next 40 years of Moses' life, we see God do more than the previous 80. Imagine that. Think about that for a moment. Your life call, what God has prepared and called you to, you start at the year of 80 years old. That's just when you begin to start walking into what he has for you. How valuable God must have thought of Moses to spend 40 years of wilderness training on him. How valuable God must think of you. A couple of encouragements I'd like to give this morning before we close. For those of you who are here this morning, maybe it's your first time in church, maybe you've been here for a while, but you've known about God, but you've never actually had God really in your life. It's been a no about, not a no. Have you come to the point of wanting to say yes to him? Because he's been working on your heart. John 3.16, For God so loved that he gave that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God has spent time on you even though you haven't realized it. He has patiently waited on you. Because you're worth it. And today, it's possible that for maybe some of you, you're ready to give your yes to him. Second encouragement this morning. Some of you have grown weary in your journey. In a culture like ours, it's easy to fall to the temptation of solely showing the Instagram-worthy parts of our lives. We want the things we want to be known. Can we as a church, as a family of God, take time to meet with, embrace, and encourage the deserts in our lives? Not just the pretty stuff that we think everybody will cheer and applaud us for. What's your desert today? Is it health? Is it failure? Financially, things falling apart? Work-wise, what you found your identity and your worth in is no longer doing it? Is it a moral failure that you're paying the repercussions for and in a situation you never thought you would find yourself in? Is it unlived expectations? Things you thought would be, but for some reason never have been. I want to pray for you this morning. And pray not that God will just take you out of it, but through it. Not that just that God will take the pain away. Not because I want you to experience pain, but what I want to pray for you today is I want to pray that the desert will do its work. Because the Master cares enough to bring things in your lives because He has a unique and special calling on you that He's preparing you for every step of your journey. Finally, thirdly today, what promises are you still waiting? Still waiting to be completed. Promises that you believe that God was a part of, things that he's put on your heart, visions that he's had for you, for your family, for ministry, for life. What are the promises that you believe aren't just your own, but ones God's spoken that have gone unfulfilled, that you've almost begun to no longer believe in. God has not forgotten, nor has he moved on. And I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray for courage and strength and wisdom to be able to continue. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21 says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, 
than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. you stand with me as we close this morning? I'm going to ask just for the next three minutes if you can just close your eyes during this time. Begin to just ask God, what, what do you have to say to me? The things that maybe perhaps some of the stuff that we've talked about this morning has stirred something in you, you just begin to talk to him yourself. But I want to ask a couple questions. What has God called you to? What has God called you to? I want to pray for those things this morning that I just discussed, those three areas. And first, I want to give opportunity, if there's anybody here today and you have yet to give a yes to Jesus. Again, this may be your first Sunday in a church or it may be your hundredth Sunday in a church. But you've never actually invited Jesus into your life. You've known about him, but never known him. Today, he wants to make himself known. And if there's anybody here today, I want to pray for you specifically. So if that's you, I'm just going to ask, I'm going to give 10 seconds, and if you want to lift your hand, and I'm going to pray for you this morning. Just five more seconds. If there's anybody here, I want to give that opportunity. Lord Jesus, for those of us who have yet to know you, may today be the day. There's someone here this morning that even putting up their hand just felt too burdensome. I just pray that they can say this simple invitation. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me and caring enough about me that you followed me through a lot of stuff. Thanks for chasing me down. Today I invite you into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Come in in me and help me to live for you. Help me to hear your voice and to know you every day of my life and serve you. In Jesus' name. For those this morning that hear there's weariness in the journey, you are tired. You are worn. You've given up hope and you believe that God has maybe forgotten you. I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, you see and you hear every word we speak, every hurt that we've experienced, you have experienced. Lord, although it seems paradoxical in my mind. God, I thank you for the challenges. I thank you for the hurts, for the ones that you bring in our lives, but that help develop us, those deserts that bring us to the place of recognizing we need you. And for those of us who need to be encouraged again today to continue to put one foot in front of the other, I pray right now just for a special reminder, God, that you are with them. You are, I am. May we, like Moses, have that encounter with I am right now, that your Holy Spirit would just gently speak to our hearts and minds. Help us not to drown ourselves, but save us from ourselves, God, where we've become destructive as we've tried to make our own dreams come about. Teach us what it is to daily rely on you and to seek you. For those of us who have not spent the time, help us to be patient in waiting on you, for you to bring about, for you to bring about that special person for those who are waiting for a spouse, for you to bring about that opportunity for work, for you to bring about that opportunity for ministry, Lord, for you to bring about that dream for family, God, for all of those things that you have spoken. Help us to bathe those in prayer with you. And in that, find a comfort and a peace knowing that you will be faithful to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. In our conversations we're going to have in a moment, help us to not just live on the surface, God, in our lives. 
Help us not just to run through or complain about our deserts, but God, may we encourage one another in our deserts and challenge each other about what you are doing. I pray this now in Jesus' name. And if you agree, say amen. Amen.